Um, then, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our fourth lecture. Uh, this week, we're going to be mainly uh, describing the data structures and algorithms that are used to uh, identify the similarities between uh, the reads and the reference genomes to, so that we can facilitate a quick search in the large space of uh, the reference genomes. Um, uh, so if you remember um, last week, uh, we uh, started uh, essentially with, uh, we described the sequencing technologies and then we mentioned that uh, all of these sequencing technologies that we covered share a common disadvantage, which is uh, the reads that we generate, they lack the uh, order and the location information uh, regarding their origin from their uh, corresponding uh, genomes. In other words, we don't know uh, where these reads are coming from in, in, in their organism. Uh, because they don't carry that uh, location information and also order information. Uh, rather, we are essentially stuck with, let's say, this bunch of random uh, 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 reads, let's say, DNA fragments uh, that may have either short or, uh, or long uh, lengths. And uh, the goal essentially, or the problem that we need to tackle in that case is uh, we need to reconstruct the entire genome uh, from many uh, sequenced reads uh, if our goal is to analyze the entire genome. And we said that this is like a solving a puzzle. The reads would be the pieces of the puzzle and then we would need to essentially reconstruct the puzzle from these uh, reads or the pieces and uh, one uh, good news was that we uh, have a reference genome that we can look at uh, so that we can take some hints, let's say, from the reference genome to identify the corresponding position of these reads. And uh, there were essentially uh, some trade-offs between certain technologies. For example, some technologies uh, produce short reads, making reconstruction of that puzzle uh, more challenging because we may not be able to figure out whether a piece may be coming from this, for example, this position or this position because the pieces will be too short, making the identification also challenging, accurate identification challenging. For long reads, it's a bit easier, but then um, uh, long reads are uh, essentially a bit more earnest. So this is around now 5% to 1% rather than 15%. And uh, essentially, this uh, figure was showing a trade-off between the short reads and the long reads, uh, depend, uh, depending on their lengths and then their accuracy. And this essentially is the uh, the pipeline that uh, we are interested in in, in solving, uh, in in covering uh, throughout our lectures. And we already covered the sequencing part, and uh, we said we would be focusing on this this. Uh, this uh, other step in the uh, uh, genome analysis, which is the read mapping step um, that tries to solve that uh, puzzle. So the read mapping, in again, in a general term, the goal is to solve, let's say, life's puzzle from sequencing output. So we're not really solving the real puzzle uh, from pictures, but uh, in a sense, we're trying to solve the life's puzzle, which is a DNA or RNA, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, and there are uh, essentially several ways to, uh, two main ways to perform read mapping, uh, the, uh, but the most common way is to map the reads to a reference genome. The reference genome is, uh, let's say, a previously known and, and representative uh, 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 sequence of a particular genome, particular organism. Let's say it's previously constructed. We mentioned the human reference genome from the previous lectures. Uh, so we may assume that uh, that particular reference genome exists regardless of how accurate it could be or how complete it could be, which we also discussed in the previous lectures. So to map the reads to a reference genome, so this is... Uh, have a DNA fragment 
logically would look like, and this is how uh, physically may look like, and the reads that we're generating are essentially some random fragments from that uh, genome, from that DNA. And the goal is to essentially figure out where uh, these reads belong to in, in their uh, corresponding reference genome, right? So we first need to find their corresponding positions, their candidate regions in the reference genome, which in this case for this read, this could be some, somewhere in this region. And the next is to align the reads to the reference genome in a sense now we want to identify the exact matches, mismatches, insertions, and deletions compared to that reference genome so that we can identify the genomic variations that the individual possess uh, compared to, to the reference genome, which is a representative of some, let's say, uh, some certain population. Uh, uh, the challenge here is that uh, when we try to map the reads to reference genome, then this means that we're trying to map the billions of uh, short fragments of DNA from lengths to 50 to a few kilo, kilo bases, uh, let's say. But there, are, there can be millions to billions of such reads that we need to map. So, And the human reference genome is also large if, if we are mapping the reads to a human. So this is this means that like there is a, essentially a, there needs to be some efficient search that makes it practical in this large uh, 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 space uh, of 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 the reference genomes, right? Um, so this is uh, this is essentially another way of doing read mapping. Uh, I mentioned two main ways. Uh, in the previous slide, one way would be mapping the reads to a reference genome, and the second way would be mapping the reads without the reference genome, right? So we may not have a reference genome for every organism, but in that case, what are we going to do? So we can still do or generate, uh, reconstruct uh, the genome again, solve the puzzle somehow without looking at the picture. Uh, and the way to do it is to Look at the reads. Uh, look at the, the essentially uh, uh, the similarities between reads, and then try to somehow uh, identify matching similarities between them, so that we can reconstruct the puzzle by looking at how uh, similar each piece uh, uh, to each other is. And uh, so this is essentially what we get after sequencing. So these are reads and. Uh, they have uh, different, let's say, portions of the sequences. And what we can do is we can find overlaps here, right? So uh, this part may be overlapping with this part, and this part may be overlapping with this part, and so on. So the colors indicate this shared content between reads. And of course, uh, we don't know uh, which strand is being uh, sequenced at the time. So this means that maybe the reverse complement of the DNA will match with the, the forward comp, uh, version of the DNA, let's say. So this means that we need to take the reverse complements somehow. So I do the animation again here. We take the reverse complements of the sequences to figure out whether there is a matching region uh, of these reverse complements with the other sequences. But then what we do is we uh, somehow remove some unnecessary or extra information and then find the link, link between these overlaps so that we can take somehow a consensus to construct the assembly from these overlapping pieces. So this is a high level explanation of how uh, 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 construction of, let's say a reference genome or a, as, as, as we call a Dino assembly is performed by looking at the overlaps. So we're going to be covering this step more in the next week. And uh, so if you go back to a read mapping to a reference genome, so we said the reference genome is huge and the read is relatively shorter uh, than the reference genome. So you may assume that this is the entire reference genome, let's say, and this is uh, the read. And uh, one way to perform a search to identify whether this read, let's say, aligns uh, to that reference genome and uh, to identify how it aligns and where it aligns, what we can do is starting from the very first position of the reference genome, we could essentially try to 
align every character of that read uh, to that uh, region in the reference genome. And then we could essentially do this for starting from every character of the reference genome until the end of the reference genome in, in, in this way, essentially, like this read would be traversed through the entire reference genome performing the same alignment operation over and over again, but this is very expensive. And imagine that you need to do it for every read that we may have few thousands, millions or billions of reads depending on the data set. But then, uh, then the question is, will it be practical? And the answer is easily no. And you can uh, guess why looking at this complexity. It would take perhaps years uh, to, to complete such an alignment for a single data set, uh, uh, given a regular uh, von Neumann architecture. Uh, so uh, then there should be some ways, right, that makes this uh, read mapping step practical and more efficient. And of course, the answer is yes, we're going to be covering these. And such an uh, analysis is usually done in three steps. Uh, so we're going to be covering these steps, but before that, I also want to show uh, how we sequence, uh, uh, how we store uh, the sequence uh, data to, let's say, common uh, file formats uh, to store uh, the sequences. One uh, format is called the FASTA format, is over here, and the other one is FASTQ. But these are pretty similar to each other. Uh, in the FASTA format, we have Two line, uh, two lines per each read. Uh, so a FASTA file may include uh, many reads, right? And for every read, we have two lines, uh, or let's say two. Uh, so it's not necessarily two lines, but let's say we have two layers for every read. So one layer is an identifier is an identification layer or identifier line, let's say. And this identification is, gives a unique, is supposed to give a unique name for that read so that we can identify that read. Uh, for example, when we map this read to a reference genome, we want to basically be look at this FASTA file again and then see what was the sequence, right? Maybe the alignment information will just include this ID information. It will say this ID maps to a reference genome at this position, but optionally, it may not include the exact uh, sequence information and you may want to go back and then see what sort of sequence it was. Uh, so in order to essentially extract the sequence information uh, accurately, we need to have an ID uh, to go and look at. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and in the second layer, so I said, uh, incorrectly, sorry. <clears throat> so I said two lines, but <clears throat> it's not uh, essentially a line uh, uh, because uh, there are multiple conventions of FASTA file. So you may, uh, for some uh, formats, you may see two line really. One line is the ID, the other line is the full sequence. But some other formats, you may see essentially multiple lines for the sequence and one line for the ID. And that multiple line may include the fixed length uh, sequences except the last line. Uh, but regardless, what we have in FASTA is the read ID starting with this particular uh, uh, unique uh, character uh, uh, greater than sign. And then until you see the next uh, uh, read ID, or maybe until you reach the end of the file, whatever you have in between will be the read that corresponds to that read ID. So I hope this was uh, uh, clear. And the FASTQ is basically very similar to FASTA. Additionally, it includes some quality information per base. Here, these are encoded with the 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 uh, the, the ASCII format, and then each number, let's say that each character is corresponding to uh, shows the quality of that particular character. So E, 
I, although I don't remember on top of my head what was the exact value for E, but essentially by looking at this, the corresponding values of these ASCII characters, uh, you can essentially see how uh, accurate this base is. And these quad scores are usually uh, assigned by the base colors. You know, these base colors translate the raw data to the uh, bases to indicate whether this space is like to be to a sequencing error or it is uh, an accurate, let's say, an, a base. So this is providing some additional information about the accuracy of, of each base, these FASTQ files. And that's why we have Q here is a quality. Uh, uh. So then I guess we can start covering uh, uh, how uh, we can perform this quick uh, or practical read mapping in three steps. So what we really want to do is that we don't want to check every character in the FASTA file and every character in the reference genome, rather somehow uh, maybe uh, take some subsequences, maybe even subsample uh, uh, sample subsequences in, in the sequence file, maybe in FASTA or FASTQ. And what we want to do is that we want to quickly somehow identify whether they exist in the reference genome or not. And if they exist, maybe we can go further and do more complex operation rather than checking uh, every character for every position in reference genome, perhaps this could provide a more practical solution. And this is uh, what we're going to explain in three steps. So the step one is usually uh, uh, is an offline step, is usually a one-time task where uh, we extract some subsequences from the reference genome. So you may assume these different colors are different subsequences that we extract from the reference genome. And somehow we want to store uh, these subsequences using some data structure, such that when we query this data structure with some other subsequence, what we want to achieve is that uh, we want to quickly be able to say that uh, whether that given subsequence exists in the reference genome or not. So this means that we need to extract subsequences accurately and then store them such that we, in an efficient way, we can ex uh, 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 query this data structure efficiently to answer the question whether a given subsequence exists in the reference genome or not. And if it exists, maybe we can say, oh, then maybe there's some similarity over there uh, between the read and the reference genome. So uh, uh, such a data structure, uh, a one way of, uh, implementing such a data structure is to implement hash tables. There are other ways of doing it. For example, uh, FM index is an, uh, perhaps an, another uh, way of, let's say, indexing the reference genome, but we're going to be covering the hash table uh, based uh, indexing uh, in this lecture. So the way that it works is uh, basically uh, what we do is we extract the uh, subsequences Sorry, again. So we uh, extract the subsequences from the reference genome. So I assume that the green is a certain subsequence. And what we do is that we use this subsequence as a key in the hash table. So there are multiple ways of converting this uh, subsequence uh, to a key, we could simply directly use the sequence itself, the string itself as a key, right? But then there could be some problems because that subsequence could be, let's say, extremely large, maybe let's say 50 characters, 100 characters long. But this means that you need to really have a huge hash table to, uh, let's say, reserve the efficient space for all such possible keys. So then I guess one other efficient way of doing it is to somehow hash these strings and then generate hash values uh, from these substrings so that we can use these hash values uh, as a key in the hash table, which we refer as also a seed uh, 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 that are stored in the hash table. So then <clears throat> what we store additionally is that we store the value. Uh, for that corresponding key, right? So in the hash table structure, we have a key value pair. Given a key, hash table returns a value if it exists. 
So in our case, the uh, our value is the list of locations that particular seed exists in the reference genome. So imagine that I give you, uh, let's say I give you the yellow uh, seed, right? So I qu query this yellow seed in the hash table. Then what it will return me quickly is that this, it, what it will tell me is that this yellow seed uh, exists in these positions, for example, three, five, 12. So when I look at these positions, maybe I'll see directly the yellow, right? So here the th third positions somehow and the fifth position somehow. So this, this is somehow a quick way of identifying whether a subsequence exists in the reference genome and where they exist, if, if so, right? So this, this can quickly tell me uh, whether the particular subsequence uh, is located in the reference genome. So these are essentially the seed locations located in the reference genome. Uh, so these uh, seeds uh, are usually generated from, as I said, subsequences, which we refer to them as k-mers usually. So that k-mer literally means a string of uh, length k, right? K is, uh, is uh, corresponding to the length of the subsequence. Uh, for example, if uh, I tell you a twinning error, then this means that we are extracting some subsequence of length two. And of course, depending on, I guess, the, the courses that you've taken previously or the, the uh, applications or the projects that you work on previously, you may have heard of this K-mer in different uh, terminologies, maybe an n-gram or q-gram. So these are all referring to, to the same thing, essentially. <clears throat> but then the question is, uh, which seeds or k-mers we need to store in the hash table, right? Because depending on which seeds that we're storing, this significantly affects the accuracy and the space requirements of the hash table. And there are essential different strategies to select and store uh, uh, the k-mers. So one strategy is to extract all possible k-mers from a reference genome. So we call it extracting all overlapping k-mers. So they are overlapping because of uh, the reasons that I'm going to explain next. So imagine that this is our reference genome. It starts with GCTA and then it goes on with some other sequences. Uh, if you want to extract all the overlapping k mer then we need to start from the very beginning. And there should be a length to that k. So in this case, the length of the K or the length of the subsequence that we're extracting is seven. So we extracted the, extracted the first k -mer. So the next k -mer would be uh, essentially the next subsequence that we would extract after shifting this, let's say, window by one character, right? So we were at here initially. Now we're shifting by one character, and now we're here. So this is what we have now. So this is the second k -mer. And then we extract the uh, other k by shifting again one character, so on until we reach the end of the reference genome. So this means that now we extracted all the overlapping k uh, <clears throat> So here, the k length is seven again because the length of the subsequences are uh, uh, seven. And what we usually do is that we hash each of these uh, subsequences or k using some hash function, usually a low collision hash function, and then store uh, the hash value as a key and uh, store the position of this uh, k-mer uh, uh, as a value in the hash table. So it's like a list of positions. So I'm, when if I see this particular k-mer somewhere else, then this means that I'm going to generate the same hash value, then I'm going to have multiple positions for that k-mer as a, as, a, as a value in the hash table. Uh, so this means that I'll immediately know how many locations that this particular camera appears in the reference genome. Uh, so if, if in case I need to go to these each of these positions and then check uh, to do further computation, let's say. <coughs> so the benefits uh, <clears throat> of such an approach is that it uh, in, uh, it has high sensitivity because there is no information is lost. Where literally, maybe there is even a redundant information here because uh, uh, subsequent k-mers uh, contain some redundant information, right? So here you can see this type of sequence is shared across k-mers. So this means that no information is lost and there is even redundant information. And this means that 
as a downside. It, it also incurs large uh, storage space requirements. Uh, so these are essentially the benefits and the downsides of uh, storing all cameras in a hash table. So the question is, do we have other strategies that may provide perhaps slightly uh, uh, less accuracy, but still uh, maybe a better uh, storage requirements? And the answer is uh, yes, for sure. Uh, one strategy for this is, uh, is called uh, essentially minimizers. <clears throat> And uh, this is basically a sampling strategy. Uh, uh, and how it works is, is as follows. So imagine that uh, we extract all overlapping cameras again. So we're not storing them yet, but still we're extracting them, right? So these are all overlapping cameras. And then at the time, let's say we consider only a W amount of these overlapping cameras. In this case, W corresponds to a window. And in this case, our window is four. We are somehow considering four cameras at this point. And the length of these Ks are seven. So what we do is that in a given uh, window of cameras, we hash all of these uh, cameras in the, in the same window and then generate their hash values. So what we do is that we find the hash value, we find the minimum hash value. In this case, maybe this one provides the minimum hash value. And then store only this one in the hash table. Rather than storing all of these, we store <clears throat> the one that provides the minimum hash value, essentially, in the hash table. So doing this, we avoid somehow storing all of these in the hash table, and rather uh, we store only the minimum uh, hash value. So this means that we we sampled almost one in a four ratio, let's say. Uh, so this means that then our sampling strategy will it make the mechanism less secured? So uh, <clears throat> so the answer is uh, somehow yes and no. First, let's mention the benefit of this approach. As we said, uh, there's a redu reduced storage requirement due to some clever sampling, right? But the downside is we have a reduced sensitivity, of course, compared to extracting all cameras because definitely we're losing some information. But the question is how much of information are we losing? So if you're interested in this, uh, there is a paper uh, that describes the uh, theoretical, let's say, proof behind these minimizers from 2002. Unfortunately, I don't have the link here. Uh, uh, but I guess... Uh, if you search for the minimizers and 2002 uh, uh, paper, probably uh, you're going to identify that paper. But it answer, essentially what that paper tells is that <clears throat> if two documents or two sequences uh, are similar, let's say. So in this case, uh, two sequences may be some region in the reference genome and a read, right? Assume that this, this region and the read are similar to each other. Uh, so this means that if you set your uh, window parameter and the camera parameter uh, accurately, then this means that it is guaranteed that they will share a minimizer. <clears throat> so then there's some theoretical proof behind it uh, that two similar sequences, given that these parameters are set right, two similar sequences will share a minimizer. So then this is a good approach, a good enough approach, right? Maybe it's not reducing the sensitivity that much. So then we're sampling it still and we're not reducing accuracy significantly. So uh, the next, uh, the other approach is called uh, space seats. Uh, so if you uh, look closely to the previous approach, what we're essentially doing is that we are, uh, hashing some sequence and then storing in a hash table. So this means that when we find the match for a hash value, so this means that we found some exact match for that particular sequence. So that exact match requirement is somehow limiting uh, some of the applications because uh, if two uh, sequences are similar to each other, <clears throat> they don't have to contain, let's say, exact matches and they don't necessarily have to contain exact matches, right? They may still contain some few mismatches between them, but still those sequences could be similar to each other, right? 
So then this means that by requiring this exact matches, maybe we are somehow missing some important uh, locations or some, some important matches that we could find, let's say. And the idea behind spaces is to somehow uh, minimize such an effect so that we could identify, let's say, uh, uh, matches between similar uh, k-mers. And the way to do it is to apply a pattern to the sequences before hashing them. So it's in a sense that we are inserting some uh, don't care characters at a fixed positions of the k-mers, right? So assume that our pattern uh, for every sequence, our pattern will insert don't care character at the second let's say, and the fifth uh, positions of any given sequence, right? So when you do this, then this means that if we have, let's say, mismatches at these positions, right, uh, then if you didn't apply a pattern, then this means that you would generate completely different hash values because this is how most of the low collision hash functions work, right? So they don't care about the similarity but rather, given some sequence, it will generate a hash value. And regardless whether two sequences are similar or not, uh, these hash values will generate a completely different hash value. So this means that even if you have one, for example, mismatch between two sequences, then you may end up getting completely different hash value. Then this means that you may not be able to find matches between them. But then, if you insert these don't care characters, and if you are lucky, such that your don't care characters appear at the positions where the mismatches appear between sequences, then this means that you just made these mismatching characters same because you inserted don't care character here, for example, an X. So this means that when you hash them, they will end up generating the same hash value. So again, let's look at here. If you just hash these, they are different sequences, right? Because this character and at this character, they are different. So they should generate different hash values if you use a low collision hash function. But when you apply don't character, don't care characters here, then this sequence is exactly same as this sequence somehow. And this means that if you give the sequence to a hash function, then it's supposed to generate the same hash value. Then this means that you'll find matches, although the original sequences uh, were. Uh, somehow uh, they were not exact matching. So this is somehow improves the uh, accuracy, right? This is the benefit of this approach. But then one downside is that there is a poor flexibility here uh, because those patterns are usually a fixed pattern. This means that they are applying don't care characters at a fixed position and then you should get lucky, lucky, let's say, to uh, essentially be able to generate the same hash value for similar sequences only if the mismatches appear at these don't care positions. So this is essentially the trade-off uh, uh, or the downsides of the benefits of using space seeds. And this is good for, let's say, uh, tolerating mismatches. And there is another seeding uh, approach. We call these approaches seeding algorithms, by the way, or camera selection algorithms, uh, because they tell us, they, they tell us the mechanisms, how to select the seeds. And, and these seeds are stored, let's say, in hash tables as hash values, right? Essentially, whatever the hash value that we're generating here is a seed and seed to the hash table. And the mechanism that leads to that hash value is, is a seeding technique, uh, to explain it broadly. And another seeding technique is a stromers. So this is somehow similar to minimizers, but it takes a further step. And there are several ways of doing strop merge, and this is one of relatively the easier way, easier mechanisms of strop merge. So what it does is that assume you have these sequences, and these sequences may be similar to each other, but only maybe <clears throat> uh, they may still include some different inserted or deleted characters between them. But in general, maybe they could be similar to each other, like these long sequences. So if you if you want to then somehow tolerate these insertions and deletions that may happen between similar sequences, what we could do is first, we could first identify the minimizers, let's say, with an each sequence. 
and then consider only these minimizers and in a sense that link them, right? So this means that you somehow ignore whatever in between these minimizers and then just link these minimizers together as a single sequence. So what happens is that if uh, two sequences, let's say, share a series of minimizers, then they should end up generating exactly the same uh, Strobmer sequence, right? So we call these Strobmer sequences or Strobmer seeds because if they share the same series of minimizers, if you link them, then they'll end up generating exactly the same sequence. So this means that when you hash these, then they are also supposed to generate the same hash value. So this is then like uh, enabling or finding multiple minimizer matches at once, let's say, uh, between uh, sequences, uh, rather than looking at them by one by one. And this provides certain benefits, especially when you consider not only we apply, we can apply a minimizer technique here, but maybe some other techniques, some random techniques, let's say, that may define which characters to link here, such that uh, once linked, perhaps maybe two similar sequences will have the same strober sequence, eventually the same uh, hash value. So this is another seeding technique. And the benefit is, again, the increased sensitivity <clears throat> because it tolerates the insertions and deletions but downside is again, there is some reduced flexibility because the selected k-mers, once linked, after linked, they should exactly match between sequences. So I guess like you can see these seeding approaches, uh, even though they tell us how to generate the seeds and how to generate the hash values, <coughs> they still require exact matches of the resulting, let's say, sequences. Right, and this is uh, still something that we want to avoid. We still want to, even though we generate the seed sequence, and these seed seed sequence may be, let's say, may not be exactly matching with some other seed sequence, but maybe it includes only one mismatch or two mismatches. If you if you look at here, for example, these two stop mirrors are now exactly matching, but they may not be exactly matching, for example, if there was a single character change here, right? But then the question is, does this mean that these, these two corresponding sequences are <clears throat> too dissimilar to each other? In most cases, the answer should be no, because if there is a single mismatch, they still have, pot they are potentially still similar to each other. But since essentially how we're using these hash values, how because we're using low collision hash functions, even though there's a single mismatch over here, the resulting hash value will be significantly different. So the question is, how can we avoid this? So there is another seeding technique that is uh, <clears throat> referred as fuzzy seeding, fuzzy uh, seed matching. And the goal is to essentially tackle that problem. So we identify this seeding, fuzzy seeding mechanism as like, uh, uh, it can enable certain things. For example, it can enable assigning the same hash value to highly similar seeds. So remember this space C, right? So these are, although we applied some pattern here, these two sequences are not exactly matching, right? Because here there is a, there's still a mismatch. So then this means that you were just unlucky selecting this particular pattern. So if you had selected this pattern, maybe you would end up generating the same hash rate. But then the question is, maybe here there's also uh, some other mismatching characters and so on. So this is a never ending question. So then this should be whatever the sequence we have, that whatever the sequence we generate after applying the seeding mechanism, if that resulting sequence is highly similar to each other still, regardless if it is exactly matching or not, a fuzzy seeding technique should enable generating the same hash value so that we can find uh, matches with a single hash value lookup, matches of these highly similar seeds, right? Uh, by looking at the hash table. And still, if two seeds are highly uh, dissimilar to each other, this such a fuzzy seeding technique should still generate different hash values they are too different than each other, right? So, so that we can, uh, we don't find matches 
between highly dissimilar seeds. And of course, this such a single hash value cup can be high performed because we are still using hash values to query the hash, real, hash table. So this is like a single query to the hash table and also the uh, space efficiency because we're storing the hash values in a compact hash table and so on. Uh, uh, so then this means that if you are uh, uh, using low collision hash functions, then this means that you need to find exact matching seats. And this means that maybe you're missing some useful and novel seed matches by doing so. Uh, and for such a fuzzy seeding technique do, uh, does not necessarily use low collision hash functions, but maybe uses some uh, clever techniques to generate, to be able to generate the same hash value for highly similar seeds. And so that it also enables rethinking the other parameters related to read mapping, et cetera, uh, further. And this is what we do in this paper. This is a blend that was published uh, early this year. Uh, this is a mechanism that can enable generating the same hash value for highly similar seeds. Uh, and if you're interested in, you can take a look at this paper to learn more about it and how we how we do it, how we enable fuzzy seed matching. But essentially, uh, depending on depending on the mechanism, the seeding mechanism that we're applying, this is essentially defining the content of the of the hash table or or let's say the index that uh, we are building, and it is also defining how quickly. The index, the indexing technique, and also the seeding techniques are defining how quickly we're building that index table and how large it is, etc. Right. So then there are different uh, indexing techniques. Uh, they, they have different trade-offs in terms of their, let's say, uh, uh, seeding time, meaning how long it takes to query that index to identify the seed matches, right? And how large the index is, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can essentially check this paper uh, to, to learn more about it. So this is the first step. It was quite long, but uh, we'll go over the rest of the steps relatively quickly, at least the second step, because I believe you'll understand the gist of it more easily now, now that we covered the content of the hash table nicely, right? So when you're building building the index using hash table, the keys are the seeds, essentially the hash values uh, of certain uh, subsequences that we generate from reference genomes. And the values that we store along with these keys are the list of positions that are these uh, subsequences exist in the reference genome. Uh, and this is a one-time task. Uh, I'm saying this is a one-time task because we do it for every reference genome once, let's say, uh, assuming that the reference genome stays uh, the same, which is not always the case, but uh, the same reference genome is used multiple times, let's say, right? So then this means that you can uh, index it once and then use it multiple times. Uh, and of course, depending on the parameters of the seeding technique, you may need to reconstruct the indexing uh, index structure again, but we're assuming that uh, given a parameter and given a reference genome that is constructed only once. So then the next question is, how can we query that index? In our case, how can we query that hash table so that we can find similarities between a read and the reference genome quickly? And this is the second step, querying the index using reads, uh, see, uh, using the seeds from reads. So what we do is we apply the same seeding strategy on the reads again, for example, uh, if you had applied minimizer seeding given certain parameters such as W, window, and K, we should use the same parameters here so that we'll find the uh, uh, consistent matches. So we apply the same seeding on the reads, and this means that we're extracting some subsequences again from the reads. And what we do is that we use the same hashing mechanism again to generate the hash values. And then we query the hash table that we constructed previously to, and ask whether that particular seed exists in the reference genome. And if it exists, then I quickly can tell that, okay, then there is the shared subsequence between a read and the reference genome, right? Quickly. Be, so you remember the very first naive approach that I showed you. In that case, we would need to be 
checking every character one by one in the reference genome uh, and every character in the read to identify whether there is a match and whether that read aligns well to reference genome or not. But here, what we do is that first we start with some subsequences that are extracted from the reads and also from the reference genome. And then first we try to find quick matches between these uh, subsequences before we do further analysis, right? So this enables us to uh, reduce, let's say, the uh, uh, space um, uh, uh, search space dramatically from the entire reference genome to the uh, certain positions in the reference genome that this hash table tells us. So it, the hash table is telling us, given that subsequence from the read, you need to go and look at these positions in the reference genome, and then that's on it, let's say. So this is uh, more or less the abstracted way of it. And then we do this, right? Uh, we take the seat, let's say, and then it tells us these positions. And then uh, we essentially go and check the other uh, uh, seat and then it tells us these positions and so on. So the other step that we do is that, uh, that the seeds that we extract from the read and the locations that we extract from the reference genome is there essentially a list of positions that are close to each other, right? Because then if, if there's a list of positions or the chain of seeds that are uh, close to each other in the reference genome, then this means that this the, the order of the seeds also, and also the distance of the seeds also matching the distance and order of the seeds in the reference genome. So it's not like only blindly matching or finding matches of certain subsequences, but then also the next step could be checking. Now you have, let's say, multiple matches of seeds, right, between a read and the reference genome you know, using different seeds. Is there essentially a chain of seeds, a chain of different seeds that appear closely, both in the reference genome and the read, with a similar order that they appear in the read and the reference genome? And we call this a chaining technique. That's also a dynamic programming technique that I'm not going to explain here, but chaining uh, algorithm can give you this so that you can somehow filter out some of the seed positions quickly and then focus on some other ones that are essentially close to each other. Or there are some other filtering techniques that quickly filters out uh, some unlikely positions. Because it's important to do so, because if we still apply aligning the algorithm for every position that we get from the reference genome, still it may be too costly. Maybe there are some obvious positions that we can quickly eliminate before doing the alignment so that, uh, again, uh, it won't be a costly search algorithm. So there are some heuristic and optimizations over here, as you can see. Uh, so essentially, querying the hash table with hash values of Cs, to, it, it enables us quickly finding a list of possible mating locations. But this is this was the second step. And the third step, so assume that now we have some, let's say, regions that we identified as similar between the reference genome and the read, thanks to, let's say, some uh, chains of seed meshes, let's say, right? Now we can say, starting from this position of the reference genome to this position of the reference genome, there is there may be some similarity uh, for that particular read uh, starting at this position and then ending at that position. So then the question is to finalize that question, right? So how can we tell uh, quite confidently that uh, uh, the, the read and the reference genome at that given position is highly similar to each other, meaning they differ from each other by certain edit operations, right? Uh, so the edit operations, what the edit operation would do is when you apply that certain edits to one of the pair of the sequences here, this could be reference genome, the portion in the reference genome, and this could be a portion in the read. And what the edits could tell us that, for example, if you change this and change this, meaning when you make two edits, and this sequence will exactly be the same as this sequence. So the, the goal is to identify that, how many edits that, and what sort of edits we should do so that we can make this sequence identical to this sequence, right? Uh, and this is what alignment does. This is a dynamic programming uh, type of approach. It uh, checks all possibilities in a sense, 
for every base given a region and then tries to tell you that whether that particular pair of sequence aligns to each other. And the alignment is defined by, let's say, the scores or the penalties, let's say, that are assigned depending on the matches or insertions that deletions that uh, each base have may have at each position, uh, 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 which is then which can then finalize the alignment uh, answer. So, uh, so I quickly mentioned the edit distance or the edits uh, that we may have between a pair of sequences. And edit distance is basically uh, the, the the minimum number of edits. Let's say, for example, insertions, deletions, or substitutions needed to make the let's say one sequence exactly the same as the other sequence. And in that case, we our sequences are reads and the reference segment. So in this case, for example, we have organization and operation sequences, let's say, and maybe assume that organization is the reference sequence and the operation is the read sequence. And when you apply an alignment, uh, you can get such an operation. For example, here, uh, the blue may tell us there is an insertion right, in the read co co compared to the reference genome. Here, the yellow are the matching positions. Here, this pinkish part is the deletions, meaning there are some deleted characters in the read compared to reference genome and so on, right? So the, all of these operations, when you count them, you're going to count seven edits, let's say. And this is essentially the optimal, minimum uh, number of, let's say, operations uh, that you can do to make this operation string identical to the organization string. And there is, as you can see, there is no one answer. There could be multiple answers to do so. But what we're interested in mainly also, what is the minimum number of operations? And given that minimum number of operations, can we tell that these strings align to each other? Of course, these are all set by the, these scores that fill up the dynamic program table that I mentioned in the previous sample. And this is another example, again, that tells us uh, the, these two strings align to each other given operations. So since um, uh, alignment algorithm is very costly because it requires filling up this dynamic programming table uh, uh, for every segment, every pair of uh, sequences where one sequence is coming from a certain region in the reference genome and this other one is coming from a certain region in the read. And these regions are defined by, let's say, seed matches and other optimizations that we apply next. Uh, our goal is really to apply the alignment as few as possible and only for the true regions, let's say. So we really don't want to apply alignment for regions that are not going to end up aligning. So if you do so, then this means that we just wasted computation because we aligned these two strings for no reason because they ended up not aligning to each other. So we wasted a lot of time and energy, let's say, and we really want to minimize this. And there are algorithms that are filtering algorithms and the chaining algorithms that tries to essentially reduce the workload of alignment uh, 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 in the previous step so that we only apply alignments as few as possible for only two regions. And still, even though there are certain optimizations, we still see that the alignment takes up still the, the, the large amount of time in uh, the existing read mappers uh, because how costly it is. Uh, uh, the, so there are essentially certain challenges uh, that you may have already observed so far uh, in read mapping. One challenge is we really need to find many mapping, uh, many mappings from each read because a single read may be mapping to different regions in the reference genome, right? Uh, so then how can we find all such mappings efficiently? Uh, there can be differences between a read and the reference genome. So this means that um, this means that uh, um, we don't really want to uh, basically rely on uh, um, uh, exact matches between uh, reference genome and and the and the read, right? Because an individual may have mutations compared to reference genome because we all are individuals and. Due to the, the evolutionary differences, due to the somatic mutations, et cetera, our genomes contain differences compared to every other person out there, uh, right? 
So we want to identify these differences uh, so that we can analyze the genome and make it more personal to you. And that's why we want to tolerate uh, uh, essentially uh, the mismatches uh, uh, between the read and the reference genome. And this means that we need to apply some alignment algorithms to do so, which is costly. Uh, and we need to do them really fast. So read alignment is costly because it is a quadratic time dynamic programming algorithm um, uh, because we fill up the table and also it has data dependencies. That means that you cannot really, if you have uh, the budget for parallelism, but still you may be limited by the algorithm, right? Because of the data dependencies, you need to look at some uh, previous cells to calculate a particular cell. Then this means that this particular cell is dependent on the computation of these previous cells. So this means that you cannot really fill up all the tables at once in parallel. So you need to wait for that dependency to be fulfilled. Uh, and of course, almost the entire matrix should be computed. There are some optimizations uh, such as the banded approach uh, uh, that may avoid computing the entire matrix, but in most cases, uh, we're still uh, filling up some large uh, space of the entire matrix still, which is requiring still a large amount of uh, space and uh, computational complexity. And if you're interested in learning more about, uh, let's say, why this is very costly to do so, uh, you can check this paper uh, that provides mathematical proof to it. Also, we, uh, uh, we have another paper that describes all these steps that I mentioned to you and how they evolved over the last 30 years in this uh, survey paper. So if you're interested in, you can check this one as well. And this is, uh, this is a paper that includes the steps from uh, sequencing all the way to variant calling. Uh, so if you wanna basically learn more, you can check this paper as well. Uh, so I guess the other question to answer is perhaps, uh, why do we even, um, uh, have a single reference genome, right? So, so far what we mentioned is that uh, there's a read and then that read maps to a reference genome. And that reference genome is defined as the representative, let's say, uh, sequence of a particular organism. Uh, but this is essentially what it is, right? So the reference genome, for example, for a human reference genome contains around 3 billion characters. And it determines that certain characters of an individual, right? For example, eye color, the shape of face, their allergies and other things, etc. But essentially how it is generated is basically from, uh, it's not representative of uh, the entire population of, of, uh, of human species, right? It's only a representative of a certain individuals. Uh, and it may differ from individual to individual, but we're still looking at this particular reference genome to identify uh, the differences from reads uh, compared to that particular reference genome, right? And we may have millions of reads and the origins are not known. And what we do is that uh, we essentially find some exact matches between this reference genome and the reads that we have, and then try to reconstruct the rest of the uh, face, the rest of the picture, starting from these exact matches, let's say. and Maybe up to a certain point, we may be able to uh, construct this uh, picture of an individual by looking at the reference genome. Uh, but the problem arises is, uh, let's say, substantially different than the reference genome, such that it incurs uh, variance, right? Because uh, the reference genome and the individual will not be exactly the same, it will include some variance. So this means that we may still be able to find, we may still be able to map our reads and align our reads to that particular reference genome uh, because they will share enough similarity, let's say, right? Because we use alignment algorithms and those alignment algorithms tolerate mismatches and insertions, et cetera. So they share, they tolerate uh, differences up to a certain point. But how about the reads that, even the alignment algorithms cannot align. So it doesn't mean that these reads do not belong to that individual. It may still belong to that individual, but we may not simply be able to align it because our algorithms cannot find sufficient similarity between the reference genome and the reads 
And this is just simply because we use that particular reference genome. So if we had used, let's say, a reference genome that is relatively close to that particular individual, then maybe we would be able to align these reads to that uh, reference genome using the same algorithm. So the question is, is using a single reference genome a good idea? And this is basically known as a reference bias. And to solve this, there are there could be two perhaps main approaches, right? One approach is then let's not use single reference genome, but let's construct multiple reference genomes and map the reads to each of them one by one, uh, right? So this means that this is a, this is an approach maybe that can improve the accuracy, but this is not a really scalable approach because we're literally increasing the runtime by n times if you use n different reference genomes eventually. Uh, uh, so then this is not a relatively a scalable approach, essentially, right? So this is, for example, we may have four different reference genomes. Uh, then the question is, should we map our reads to each of them one by one? So the other approach is maybe, so the key idea here is that although these reference genomes are still going to be different than each other, in most regions, they are still going to share some similarity as well. So why don't we leverage that uh, key idea, right? For example, the Thai uh, region over here in this picture is similar across uh, multiple uh, pictures. Then the question is, do we need that redundancy uh, in different reference genomes? Or can we somehow merge all these shared information and still keep the differences also uh, in order so that we somehow be able to uh, analyze all of these differences and still spend less time on the common regions, right, between multiple reference genomes. And this is basically the idea in using graphs uh, when mapping the reads to a reference genome. So what we can do is that we can construct a single graph where the common regions are merge, let's say, into a single node, if you want to already start imagining the graph. And for the variations, we have, let's say, divergence from those nodes, right? Maybe one divergence may lead to another node showing the difference of a particular reference genome and another node maybe showing the difference of another uh, reference genome at the same position, let's say. So this means that the differences can be encoded nicely as well as the uh, similarities. And this is perhaps one way of uh, imagining it. So maybe here the differences are here, but perhaps uh, for one reference genome, we may have, after ACG, we may have T. For another reference genome, we may have G, right? And in this way, we didn't store AC, ACG multiple times, but only once because it's a shared uh, attribute apparently across reference genomes. But now we, will, we were able to also now uh, store differences, let's say, across reference genomes using such a graph structure. So uh, essentially, it's also a good time to think about the graph type of approaches and how, how we map the reads to a reference genome. But we're not going to cover uh, uh, it in more detail now in this lecture. But we will have uh, essentially a talk that is, uh, that is from our group uh, and uh, uh, where we will explain how we perform and accelerate such a read to graph mapping, let's say. So with that, this is the end of the lecture and uh, let me give you some teasers for next week. So for next week, we're going to go into the details of the uh, de novo assembly construction. We're going to answer the question, what happens if there is no available reference genome of an algorithm? And if you remember, I showed you, uh, if there's no reference genome, we can still find overlaps to construct the assembly of the reference genome of an individual. And this is what the de novo, de novo genome assembly is doing. It's building some sort of graph. And then from that graph, it's trying to identify the genome itself. So we're going to cover these steps. And also we're going to briefly be covering the steps in variant calling uh, that essentially uses the alignment information uh, in the reads and identifies, tries to correctly identify the mutations. Uh, in an individual compared to reference genome. So with that, uh, this is the end of the uh, lecture.